Hey, before we start this podcast, I want to let you know that Khaki is sponsoring this video. Now, if you don't know what Khaki is, Khaki is a fantastic website where you can buy Thomas products that won't get you price gouged out of your mind. It's really good. I like it a lot. They have some really cheap items. And when I say cheap, I don't mean like, oh, it's poor quality. I mean like price-wise, French Kiss. It is so good. They got everything from Play Rail to Ertl, Take Along, Wooden Railway. Now, the cheap prices are great, but if you want to save even more money, you can use code PDP10 to save an extra 10% off your first order. And the money that you save using the code goes to supporting me as a creator, so thank you very much if you do that. Even if you don't want to use the code, though, it is a fantastic website, and I definitely recommend. Anyways, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Khaki, for sponsoring the show. Link in the description. Now, on to the main event. Hello and welcome to the Analyzation Express, the show where I read and review a variety of Thomas content that I wouldn't be able to tackle in my normal videos. Today I wanted to tackle something a little bit different. So I'm sure most of you in the Thomas community have heard of a user that goes by the name of The Buried Truck. Now, he has a YouTube channel, he's mostly prominent on Twitter, however, and he's known for making these railway series inspired stories. Some stories that are honestly really, really darn good. Like. I'm surprised that some of these weren't actually railway series stories levels of good. These read almost exactly like they were written by Wilbert or Christopher Audrey back in the day. And you're gonna see as we get into this that there's definitely some similarities with their styles. I do think that it's a bit limiting to only write stories in this same format because, as I've said before, the railway series does follow a bit of a format, but honestly the buried truck has managed to take some interesting concepts and characters, mix them together, and put out some stories that few of them are a little bit predictable, but they're always fairly entertaining and they're always up to a similar par, if you ask me. Anyways, with that said, let's get started with the first story I want to read today, Derek and the Manor. The Fat Controller visited Derek at the work, starting right off the bat. <laughs> Hello, sir, sighed Derek. Terribly sorry for my engine trouble. Not my best first impression, is it? The Fat Controller smiled. I know you tried your best. No, worry not. The men tell me they fixed your ailments. Before you return to Edward's line, I have an important job for you. Oliver recently discovered an abandoned manor. You shall assist with its restoration. This seems like it's taking place just by this alone. Somewhere between Oliver's find and double teething troubles, which I quite like a lot. And we get to see more of Derek, which is a character who showed up for literally one episode and then never again. And I don't know why. And it, it bothers me a little bit because I feel like there was some potential there and they just didn't do anything with him. I'd be thrilled to, sir, Derek beamed. Derek was soon busy taking workmen to and from the manor. Throughout the day, he'd deliver trucks of supplies and take away rubbish. It was slow work, but he was glad to be useful. One day, Derek was resting after delivering some vans. As he dozed, he heard footsteps. Must be a workman, he thought. It wasn't. The men were having their tea break at the old station building. He looked back. In the courtyard was a smartly dressed gentleman. He stared at the manor and its surroundings before his eyes met Derek's. I say, you there, he called, strolling over. Have you seen that blasted gardener? Gardener? asked Derek. Oh, you mean the workmen. They're on tea break, sir. Yes, well, do tell them to trim these hedges in the courtyard, won't you? We certainly can't welcome party guests with an unkept garden. The gentleman turned and strolled away. Just then, the workmen returned. Who are you talking to? they asked. That gentleman in the courtyard, Derek replied. He says his hedges are in need of tending. I don't suppose any of you are gardeners. I'm quite proud of my flowers, began one workman. Not now, Ted, scowled another. In the courtyard, you say, Derek? That's a little bit of a weird sentence. I'm sure when it's voiced, it probably sounds better. I'm just, me looking at that, my brain doesn't quite click with it. They searched all over, but found no one. Whoever he was, said Ted. He wasn't wrong. This garden is atrocious. The other workman groaned. Derek just stared. How very perplexing, he thought. Later, Derek came to take the workman home, but there was trouble. The signalman's just rang. The points are jammed, sighed the driver. Won't be fixed until tomorrow. You're stuck here tonight, old boy. The driver backed Derek into the shed, then left with the workman. Darkness fell, and Derek drifted to sleep. Let the celebration begin! Derek jolted awake. Who's there? He called. He heard excited chatter coming from the manor. To Derek's supplies. Supplies? To Derek's surprise, if I could pronounce ours correctly, to Derek's surprise, light spilled from the windows. He saw silhouettes of patrons inside, laughing and dancing as music played. What on earth? Just then, a horse and carriage crossed the front of the shed. Derek jumped. The carriage stopped in the courtyard. There, greeting its passengers, was the gentleman from earlier. Excuse me, sir, Derek called. The gentleman walked over, beaming. Quite the soiree, isn't it? He chuckled. 
But sir, stammered Derek, the manor isn't ready yet. On the contrary, my good chap, it's never looked better. What a grand party it is. The gentleman sighed. I'll miss this old house dearly, teeming with memories, you can imagine. Sadly, memories aren't sufficient payment for the banks. We've fallen on hard times, and it'll only get harder from here. At least we'll have one final grand evening before we face the music. He paused and looked back at Derek with a smile. Speaking of music, I shan't miss another second of that phenomenal band. Cheerio! He hurried back inside. Derek was speechless. He didn't sleep a wink. He stayed awake, watching and listening to the party, which faded into nothing as the sun rose. Before long, his driver returned. Bless me, Derek, you look like you've been up all night. Oh, not to worry, Derek replied, trying to sound reassuring. Just a bit difficult adjusting to this shed, you see. Well, the points are mended. Let's fetch some workmen, then you can have a good rest. As the driver climbed into Derek's cab, Derek heard footsteps again. Sure enough, it was the gentleman from the courtyard surveying the garden. That blasted gardener. The party is tonight and he still has intended to these shrubs. Derek went pale with realization. At the station, the workmen piled into the coach. Derek spied the fat controller on the platform. I say, sir, may I have a moment of your time? Certainly, Derek. Not feeling unwell, are you? Never better, sir, Derek chuckled. But I was wondering about that manor. What do you plan to do with it? It shall be an attraction for tourists. We'll run special branch line services to it, with tea and refreshment for the guests. Will these services be run during the daytime, sir? The fat controller was perplexed by the question. I suppose so, yes. Will that be all right, Derek? Oh, of course, Derek smiled. Absolutely capital idea, sir. At that moment, the signal dropped, and Derek rolled away. As long as no one disturbs the party, he thought to himself. So Derek in the manor, uh, not bad. Honestly, I thought that was a pretty solid story. I don't know why Derek is specifically the character for this ghost type story. I'm not complaining by any means. Any chance to see Derek is perfectly fine in my books. I'm just a little curious because it doesn't really build on Derek's character at all. That is one thing I will say about the Barry truck is that a good few of his stories don't really develop the characters at all. It's mostly, here's a character and a situation will put the character in the situation. I feel like as we go through these, we might see a little more of that. Maybe I'm wrong. Again, there's a lot of stories here that I haven't seen, but, you know, I'm looking at some of them, like, Duck and Fergus, Emily's Army, Edwards Express, like, they don't really build the characters as much as I would like them to. Next up, we have From the Mountain. Nancy was pleased. She polished the engines in the morning and helped the refreshment lady with the daytime rush. As afternoon turned to evening, she found herself walking to a place she knew well. She stopped, gazing up at the mountains before her. Under the orange sky, everything was beautiful. She sighed contently, smiling as she continued her trek. Soundtracked by the gentle breeze and distant squawking of birds. Nothing better than this, she thought. A noise stopped her dead in her tracks. That sounds like a whistle, she thought. From the mountain? Curious, she chased after it. It wasn't the whistle of any engine she knew. It was a mournful cry. Nancy had long since left the path, pushing past brambles and over hillocks. Hillocks? That's a word I've never seen before. Again, that's not really a, a new or original occurrence on this show. I've encountered more than a few words that I've never seen. I'm gonna assume that's like overgrow or something. She had no idea where it was. Miles of mountaintop woods stretched before her. She parted the branches and bushes and gasped. There stood the remnants of an old shed. It had mostly collapsed, and anything still standing was swallowed by dark moss. As Nancy walked closer, she tripped on something. Rails! This must have been an engine shed, she thought. But how can there be a whistle without an engine? She walked around the shed. Towards the back was a slanted tin roof. She rounded the corner and, goodness, she cried. A little engine was tucked behind a small stone wall. His boiler was smudged, his funnel riddled with rust, and his face weary. He stirred, blinking heavily as his focus rested on Nancy. A visitor, he drawled. Heh, <laughs> must be my lucky day. What on earth are you doing here? asked Nancy. On vacation, answered the engine. What does it look like? I'm a pile of junk. B but, stammered Nancy, you're a steam engine. You should be on a railway, not stuck here. Can't work without wheels, kid. I ain't a steam engine, I'm a pumping engine. Or, I was. Not much of anything now. A pumping engine? When you ride rough with no care, you come off the rails. You come off the rails, you can't do your job. You can't do your job, well, they find a new one for you. Like it or not. Ain't been a true steam engine in a long time. I heard your whistle, insisted Nancy. Heh, <laughs> don't know what you heard, kid, but it couldn't have been me. No need for a whistle when you don't go nowhere. It had to be you. There's no other explanation. 
It's lucky I did come. Now you can be saved. There's no saving me. I got what I deserve. No one deserves to languish alone in a state like this, protested Nancy. Nobody considered taking me when this place was shut down, replied the engine. And I'm in worse shape now than I was back then. Look at me. Would you choose me over a working steam engine? Nancy stayed quiet. Realistically, she wouldn't. I ain't the engine that needs saving, kid. Look a little harder around here, and you'll know what I mean. I'm past the point of saving, but I don't want you to ever forget. A loud clap of thunder cut the engine off. Nancy looked up as the orange sky was blotted with gray clouds. The sound of rain on the tin roof followed. Best you get out of here, kid, urged the engine. This shit ain't much good for shelter. Nancy paused. I'll tell them all about you, she promised. No one will forget. We'll be back for you. You'll see. The engine said nothing. It only smirked at her. As Nancy ran back through the forest, desperate to find the path that brought her here, she swore she heard the whistle in the space between the thunder and rain. By morning, the storm had passed. Nancy made her way to the shed, eager to tell someone about her discovery. When she arrived, she found a group of men looking at heavily marked maps. Good morning, she called. What are you doing? We're trying to find a lost engine, said one man. Though, we're not having much luck, muttered another. Nancy beamed. Your search is over. I know exactly where he is. Giddy with excitement, Nancy and the rescuers set off to the mountain. She couldn't wait to see the look on the little engine's face. After what felt like an eternity, Nancy pushed past the bush and ran to the remnants of the old shed. Here we are, she announced. He's right around. Her smile fell. The old tin roof had fallen in, and the stone wall was in pieces. Strangest of all, the engine was nowhere to be seen. Are you having us on? asked one man sternfully. He was here, I swear, stammered Nancy. I saw him last night. Great, said a sulky rescuer, led on a wild goose chase by a silly crash. They turned around. A plume of dust rose from a spot in the hill. So men ran to overlook. We found him, they cried. We're found our sleeping beauty. Ooh, that's a... Ugh, someone's got to tell the buried truck. He's got a, he's got a typo in here. We're found our sleeping beauty. You've done it, Nancy. Nancy ran over to look, but the engine in the hole was much different. He was brown and covered with tarp tarpaulins. Ooh, tarps, okay. He was brown and covered with tarplins. He had a tender poking out the back. But, she said blankly, that's not him. The rescuers took no notice. They hurried off to phone for help. Later, the engine had been dug up from his shed and loaded onto a truck. Nancy walked over to him and he smiled broadly. Hello, dear. A pleasure to meet you. My name is Duke. I understand you're the reason I've been found. It's nice to meet you, Duke. I'm Nancy. Truthfully, it's not me you should be thanking. Nancy explained what had happened the night before. Please tell me you know that engine, she begged. We must find him. Duke was pale, but stern. If you saw that engine, it's best to forget about him. Trouble until the very end, he was. Saving him wouldn't suit his grace. He said he wasn't the engine that needed saving, and that he didn't want anyone to forget. Nancy stared in disbelief. You! He didn't want anyone to forget you! Duke's expression softened. He stared back at the shed, where the engine he knew last stood. Nancy swore she saw a hint of sorrow in his eyes. But before anything more could be said, the truck roared into life and pulled him off to his new home. Nancy never forgot what she saw that night. She was glad Duke had been rescued and often polished him at the shed. They never spoke of that day again, but always gave each other knowing looks. She continued to walk the mountain trail, but never ventured back to the ruins of the shed. She didn't know what to believe about the evening's events. Even so, she swears that sometimes she can still hear the whistle the one that drew her in, echoing around the mountain. I wonder if Nancy will ever find an answer. Don't you? Okay, now this this was a little bit better. I like this a lot. This is playing off of mid-Sodor stuff. You know, it slowly builds up to it. We're not outright told it is Smudger, but you can infer from the context clues that it is. I love that a lot. When you're not immediately outright told that a thing is what you think it is, and your mind is allowed to just, like, unravel the story for itself, that's something that I really love about stories. And it's something that you don't really see in Thomas stories a whole lot. It's usually like, okay, now we're going to tell you what's going on to a certain degree. You know, sometimes they leave things a little ambiguous, but for the most part, it's like, oh, well, you thought that you saw a ghost in the, in the station, Henry? Oh, no, that's just an old man. It's quite nice to be able to see a story just slowly unravel to the audience. I like it a lot. Next up, we're going to look at Emma's Error. Now, this is a story about the HST engine from the Railway series books. Never got adapted into the models or the CGI series, so I'm interested to see what he did here. One morning, Gordon was sizzling at the station. His first express was due out soon, and he was keen to leave. 
Morning, Gordon. Gordon stared in disbelief. Mr. Cole, is that you? He spluttered. Jem Cole stood on the platform, but instead of his grubby farming clothes, he was adorned in a suit and tie. You look very smart today, sir, Gordon smiled. If I may ask, what's the occasion? I'm off to a vehicle gala on the mainland. They've asked me to speak about my restoration work. A wise choice on their part, Gordon replied. You've done wonders for our Trevor and Elizabeth. All in a day's work, Jem blushed. I'm a wee bit nervous, though. Much more comfortable in the country than the big city. But all the same, it is exciting. I'm certainly honored to be taking you there, smiled Gordon. You'll be splendid, I'm sure. Jem laughed. Well, if the best express engine on the island believes in me, nothing can go wrong. Oh, that's the sound of the whistle. Best get to my seat. He waved goodbye as he dashed to the coach. What a lovely little getaway for Mr. Cole, Gordon thought. With a mighty whistle, he snorted out of the station and off to the mainland. I'm gonna say, just stopping right now, now that we're done with that scene, Gordon feels a little more Edward than Gordon here. Like, he, he doesn't feel quite as grandiose. That could just be me. Just his wording doesn't, doesn't strike me as Gordon, per se. If it was Edward, it'd be perfectly in character. But as Gordon, to be fair though, if this is taking place at the latter half of the Railway series where Golden is older, he's more mature, I could, I could probably get on board with this. Jem had a wonderful time at the gala. He was welcomed with rapturous applause. No, ra okay, I'm not laughing at anything written here. I just, the word rapturous is funny to me. <laughs> I've never seen that word before, but I immediately I knew what it was. Rapturous applause and was thrilled to see so many vintage machines still operating. Many familiar faces from Soda were there. Even grumpy old George, who had never looked happier. George being happy? Jeez, it must be an occasion. He enjoyed meeting friends old and new, but all the same, he was glad to be coming home to Sodor. The morning after the gala ended, he was waiting at the station for Pip and Emma to take him home. Their driver, thrilled to meet Jem, stood shaking his hand vigorously, just ripping his arm out of the socket, pretty much. Absolute pleasure to meet you, Mr. McC I keep wanting to call him Mr. McCole. It's just Mr. Cole. Absolute pleasure to meet you, Mr. Cole, he beamed. Did you enjoy the gala? Oh yes, he replied. Great fun indeed. Lovely to see a passion for those keeping old vehicles running. It certainly is, chuckled the driver. Any desire to dabble in these kinds of machines? He motioned to Emma with his thumb. Oh, I don't think so, Jim replied. There's just something about steam engines. The effort you put in to make them work just right never gets old to me. Great fun to get your hands dirty. You don't get that with buttons and wires, he finished with a laugh. Now, Pip and Emma liked steam engines, but Emma was cross when she heard the remark. As Jem headed for the coaches, she began to fuss. How rude, she fumed. To say we're simple, what an insult. Could you keep your temper in check just one time, retorted Pip. Mr. Cole is a lovely man, I'm sure he didn't mean any harm. I won't stand for it. He needs a lesson on what diesels can do. Emma, behave, Pip said sternly. He's a passenger on our express. Might I remind you we treat passengers with respect? Emma wasn't listening. As soon as the guard's whistle blew, she started with a jerk. Easy, called Pip, taking him back. Buttons and wires, buttons and wires, Emma grumbled. I'll show him, I'll show him. Emma roared along the line, her engine pounding furiously. The noise echoed all around. People in the streets looked to the sky, thinking it was a thunderstorm. Pip felt worn out. She was doing her best to keep their speed in check, but her efforts were futile against Emma's temper. I know we're a high-speed train, she huffed, but this is ridiculous. Don't dawdle, come on, barked Emma. Watch your tone, Pip snapped back. I'll not put my passengers at risk over your little charade. Charade? I don't- I don't know if- I feel like tirade might be a better word there, or tantrum. I don't think charade is- is the proper word there. Pip held back, but the more she tried to slow them down, the crosser Emma became. She roared her engine, trying to pick up speed until- BANG! Suddenly, Emma found herself going slower and slower. Ouch! she cried. What's happened? The train came to a halt, black smoke billowing from her exhaust. The driver got out to examine. You've done a number on yourself now, he sighed. I'm not surprised with the way you were carrying on. Ah, well, suppose all we can do is call for a fitter now. I hope you're happy, scolded Pip. Now you've shown Mr. McCole something, all right. I, I, I called him McCole again, jeez. Now you've shown Mr. Cole something, all right. You've shown him just how headstrong you are. Emma, quite embarrassed, chose not to reply. They waited and waited, but the fitter didn't come. They couldn't have known that he was stuck in a traffic jam trying to get to them. Time ticked on and the passengers were getting restless. As the driver examined Emma, Jem came walking up. Mind if I take a look? He asked. Be my guest, replied the driver. You're more likely to have a solution than me. Emma scoffed, but kept it to herself. One thing I've noticed about Barry Truck's story so far, he likes to just put exclamation points in places. Like, there's exclamation point after kept it to herself, 
There was one uh, for Traffic Jam trying to get to them. Emma chose not to reply, that sort of thing. It, it's certainly nothing bad. It's just a little It's a little strange seeing that many exclamation points. Because exclamation point usually is like excitement. Thing is happening. I don't know if I would put it in those same places. That could just be me, though. Jem took a look at the engine, but realized he didn't have a clue where to start. Uh, well, he stammered. If this tube connects here, and this wire goes there, hmm. At last, he gave it up. Truthfully, he blushed, I have not a clue where to start. Oh well, sighed the driver, I'll have another look. Appreciate you trying, Mr. Cole. Instead of going back to the coaches, Jem walked to the front of the train. I'm sorry I upset you, Emma. It's really my fault we're in this mess, and I can't even find a solution. Emma sighed. No, sir, it's my fault. I shouldn't have got so worked up. Pip was right, you meant no harm. Well, one thing's for sure, you certainly tested my knowledge more than old Trevor ever has, chuckled Jem. It's exciting to know I can still learn new things at my age. At last, the fitter arrived, and in no time at all, Emma's engine was repaired. They sped off to the big station, and little time was lost. Thank you for getting me home, Emma, Jem smiled when they got to Sodor. Tell you what, I'll learn all I can about diesel engines. That way, I'll be prepared for next time. Very kind of you, sir, replied Emma. But you won't see me breaking down again. I do hope you'll ride with us again soon. Pip and I will show you just what we can do. In the meantime, called Pip from the other end, you be sure to take care of Trevor. I don't want to hear about him breaking down anytime soon. Now that's a promise I can keep, laughed Jen. He gave a final wave, and the Diesels watched as he left the station, bound happily for home. A little bit of a strange line to end it, but I do like this. This does feel like it's a story that tries to stretch out and cover a, a few too many plot points at once. However, I do like the interactions with Jem Cole and Pip and Emma. I think that's really fun. I would have kind of liked to see Jem Cole be able to fix up Emma's motor there. That would have been neat. I do think it's funny that he looked at it and he was like, I don't know what's going on here. It reminds me of this one time when I first got my Nintendo DS and my dad, my uncle, and my grandpa were all crowded around it trying to figure out how the heck touchscreen worked. Like they would touch it and they would just be completely blown away. Like they could not imagine that touching a screen was like affecting something in a game. That kind of reminded me of this here. And at the same time, I guess it would make sense for Jem to not know how to fix diesels, considering he's only ever dabbled in steam engines for all we know. Like, he's fixed up Trevor, he's fixed up Elizabeth. But yeah, I guess it would make sense that he wouldn't know what diesel engines are, is the point I'm trying to make. And I think the last one we're going to tackle today is Demonstration Diesel, which again, I know nothing about. I've not read this before, so let's dive in. Oliver returned from the works feeling very sorry for himself. He was embarrassed that the trucks had pushed him into the turntable well. He hoped the other engines wouldn't tease him, but upon his arrival, he found their attention was elsewhere. In Oliver's absence, Diesel came to the yard. He was greeted with little enthusiasm, but he didn't care a bit. Duck was watching from the siding when Oliver arrived. You pay no mind to him, Duck glared. He's a menace and a must to avoid. That was easier said than done. Oliver was having a drink when Diesel slunk alongside. Well, well, he sneered. The famous Oliver. It's truly an honor to be graced by your presence. Oliver scowled. Imagine braving hordes of us diesels, just to flounder on a turntable because of mere trucks. From what I've heard, you're no expert with trucks either, Oliver quipped. You must have heard it all wrong, scoffed Diesel. Anyhow, you're lucky your little spill happened here. On the other railway, you'd have been turned into an amusement. Enthusiasts love seeing our breakdown gangs in action. We topple useless engines over, let the cranes rescue them, then do it all again. You'd be right at home amongst the scrap. Diesel cackled away. Oliver was furious, but remembered Duck's words. He knew it best to remain silent. Workmen were replacing worn tracks in a siding. Oliver shunted cranes wherever they were needed, and fetched flatbeds with new rails. He wasn't keen on working with trucks, but they gave him reprieve from Diesel. Keep those cranes ready, he called as the great western engine puffed past the turntable. Oliver's ready for his encore. At least I'm being useful, Oliver jeered. This yard's a mess. And I suppose you could do better, glared Diesel. It'll be ship -shaped soon. The trucks don't trouble me. I keep them in order, unlike some engines. He snickered away, unaware that the trucks had heard everything. The workmen made good progress. They'd ripped up the old siding, ready to lay new rails after their tea break. Unfortunately, the points weren't set properly, and along came Diesel with a line of trucks. I'll show that scrap on wheels a thing or two, he cackled. We'll show you, we'll show you, shouted the trucks. Without warning, they bumped and banged into each other. Diesel surged forward, swerved off the points, and crash! 
I think this is the second time in a buried truck story that Diesel has crashed with trucks on a set of points. I'm not saying that it's particularly a bad thing, I'm definitely not going to say that he's going to hit error levels of copy-paste, but I am seeing some similarities here. When the dust settled, there was Diesel, toppled on his side. The trucks, who remained upright, chortled with delight. Diesel said nothing. He felt sore and silly. He felt sillier when Oliver arrived. Good thing we have cranes at the ready, eh, Diesel? A very good thing, Oliver. It was the fat controller. He pointed at Diesel. I expected you to keep this yard in order, not make a muddle of it. Were it not for the rails needing to be laid, we'd leave you there to reflect on your behavior. Diesel gulped, but before the fat controller could say more, a group of boys walked up. Pardon us, sir. May we take some pictures? We've always wanted to see the breakdown gang at work. The fat controller agreed. The boys' cameras clicked and flashed as the men worked. Diesel felt most uncomfortable. Is this one of those, um, demonstrations you mentioned, Diesel? Smiled Oliver. I thought only useless engines took part in these affairs. Ah well, at least you're providing amusement. Far from being amused, Diesel thought it best to say no more. You know, as our final story, a little bit shorter than the other ones, I still liked it. I think it's a shame that Diesel is just constantly this antagonist character that's never allowed to be anything other than just kind of a dick who gets what he deserves. Again, it's another one of those little shortcomings that I've found with the Barry Truck stories is that he has really good ideas, but he ends up kind of falling into the same patterns with his stories over and over again. Like, Edward can only have stories where he triumphs. Diesel and other diesel engines can only have stories where they are boastful and then make a fool out of themselves, etc, etc. As a writer though, I definitely think he's got a better grasp on how to tell Thomas stories than basically anyone on the All Engines Go team or the people writing Big World Big Adventures. Heck, even some of the people working on the Brenner stuff I don't think truly got to grips with story structure in the same way that the Burry Truck did. I wouldn't necessarily say that following a formula makes them boring, but it does make some of them a little bit predictable. That being said though, they're all fun ideas and I like them a lot. I've certainly taken a lot of inspiration in writing my own stories from the Berry Truck, and it's always fun to see what he comes up with. With that being said though, I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you for watching, thank you to Kaki for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye